the dark into the light You have opened up our eyes I'd like to welcome you to our program, Truth For Today. I'm Pastor Steve Carr of Calvary Chapel in Arroyo Grande. Today we live in confusing times. However, God's Word can be a tremendous source of strength and guidance to those who believe. I'd like to invite you to join with us as we study through God's inspired Word. God has many truths He wants to communicate to you, but the greatest desire He has is that you might know Him and the love He has for you. He spoke through the prophet Jeremiah and he said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. These words reveal how long he has loved you and how much he cares. If you will open your heart to him, I am confident that he will reveal himself to you and greatly encourage you today. Luke chapter 9 and verse 51 we're going to begin with this morning. Now, in this particular section of the Gospel of Luke, we take a major turn. We have a definite change of direction in this, this letter that Luke has written. What he does from this point forward is explain to us what Jesus is doing just prior to the cross. You'll note in this, this passage as we begin to read it, that Jesus is setting his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. Now there were two basic ways that Jesus could go up to Jerusalem from the northern cities of the Galilee. If you know the geography of Israel, there is a, a basically level, flat, coastal plain that ascends up to the mountains that are, well, at Jerusalem is 3,000 feet above sea level. On the other side of these mountains, it descends down to uh, the Great Valley Rift, which is the lowest place on the earth. It is 1,300 feet below sea level, where the Dead Sea is. The, the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River flow into this Dead Sea. And so Jesus had two ways that he could have gotten to Jerusalem. One was to follow the Jordan River down to Jericho and then ascend up into the mountains. The second, the way that Jesus chose to go, was to go through the area of Samaria, which was through the mountainous areas. He would have just come through these mountains directly to Jerusalem. Now, as he is going through Samaria, he has a bit of a problem. He sends out the disciples before him, and they are told, we don't want this Jesus to come to our city. So he is rejected. This morning, I want to talk to you about rejection. How to deal with rejection. This is one of the most important and powerful studies explaining to us how to deal with that very difficult aspect of life. Read with me, verse 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him. 
because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now this is a very short passage, but it is jam-packed with very powerful and very important information. How did Jesus respond to this rejection? How did the disciples respond to this rejection? And most importantly, why did they reject him in the first place? Some people have the view when they read the Gospels that, I mean, Jesus went into a town and there's great multitudes and everybody's just, oh, he's so great, he's so fantastic, everybody loves him. Well, that's just not the case. As in this situation, this town didn't want to have anything to do with him. Now that sounds like rejection to me, does it not? So why did they reject him? Well, it's a very simple thing. There was a problem between the Jews and the Samaritans. Now this really takes us back hundreds of years in their history. When the nation Israel was separated into two camps, the ten northern tribes, the two southern tribes, the ten northern tribes were f taken into captivity first by the Assyrians. Now when the Assyrians conquered a people or a nation, they took the people out of that country, they removed them completely and put them in another country that they had conquered, and they took the people in that country and they put them in the other country. They did this because they believed that this was the best way to quell any rebellion in the countries and nations that they conquered. And so they completely displaced the people. So the Jews that were there were removed and foreigners were placed in their, in their uh, cities. Now, these individuals took a little of Judaism and a little of their foreign religions and they mixed them together. This is why the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. Because the Jews did not consider the Samaritans true Jews. And so there was this conflict that began literally about 6700 BC and then continued all the way into the time of Jesus. So this was a hatred and a conflict that had gone on many hundreds of years. Now, some say, well, why would they have such a hatred? Well, they just didn't agree on what the teaching of the Scripture was, on the topics of how to worship God, how to follow Him. The woman at the well, at a previous time when Jesus went into Samaria to minister, she brought up this conflict when Jesus asked her one day for a simple glass of water. And the woman of Samaria said to him in John 4, 9, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And so she clearly identifies this rift between them, this resentment among them. And she is amazed that this Jew is asking her for anything. Now, this hatred between them was not the only hatred. There was another hatred there that we see exampled in our, our newscast today. It's the hatred between the Jews and the Arabs. This is called by Ezekiel in Ezekiel 35, verse 5, when he addresses the Edomites, he said, you have an ancient hatred for the Jews. And so 
Why do they have this ancient hatred? Now, this statement is made about 600 BC, and he's talking about a hatred between the Jews and the Arabs that predated that moment, that time. It goes back all the way to Jacob and Esau and the conflict between the two of them. Now, this ancient hatred is the reason for the Arab-Israeli conflict that we see going on on our news right now. And this particular hatred is so sad because there is no way that it is going to be resolved. There is only one time in history when this ancient hatred will be put to rest. And that is when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. So if you want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray for the Prince of Peace to come to Jerusalem and to set up his kingdom here upon the earth. And that's when true peace will take place. We will have peace treaties that will be broken. We will have ceasefires that will be broken. And that is just the result of this ancient hatred. Now, to get back to our story here, the sad thing is that because of this hatred between the Samaritans and the Jews, these people rejected the Prince of Life, the Savior of the world, the one who could transform their lives. They rejected him because of this religious bigotry, this hatred between them. Now, I bring this particular issue up because that's the source of this problem and the conflict here. But it is also an issue that I think I should address with every one of you. You will share the gospel with people today, and you will find there is an ancient hatred right here in our country as well. There is an ancient hatred that is because of religious bigotry, cultural bigotry, ethnic bigotry. And bigotry, no matter how you spell it, is sin. And it is not acceptable for any person that calls themselves a Christian. This is an essential issue because I deal with it all the time. People come to me and they say, well, Steve, uh, this person who is black or Hispanic or Asian or white, they have rejected me because I am of another race. And they don't want to listen to me. They don't want to hear me. And they make comments to me that, that are obviously filled with hatred. And I share with people, you know what? Uh, men put distinction because, between other men because of race or culture or color. And it's just not a Christian response. And I say this because if you as a Christian have that religious cultural or ethnic bigotry in your family or in your heart. It is something that you need to speak up about and address in your own life or with others. In Romans chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, this is what Paul says in addressing this issue. He says, Whosoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Now notice the statement there. He says, there is no distinction. God places no distinction between men and women. No matter what color, no matter what culture, no matter what your background is, he could care less because we are all in the same boat. That's why. We all have the same need. We are all sinners by nature. And one race is not a bigger sinner than the other. Well, 
you know, these people, oh no, they, they can't. They're, they're just something different about them. No, we're all the same. There is no distinction. So if you place a distinction where God places no distinction, you are fighting against God. So this is a very important issue. If there is any place where ethnic, religious bigotry should be done away with, it is in the church of Jesus Christ. And so please address this issue in your own heart, in your own family, among those that you work with. Romans chapter 10, verses 11, 12 make it very clear. There is no distinction. And so don't allow anyone to place a distinction there. Now the second reason why Jesus was rejected in this town was not only because of their bigotry, but was, it was because he was going to the city of Jerusalem. Notice, it says in verse 53, they did not receive him. Why? Because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And so just because Jesus was going to a place that they would not go themselves because of their religious hatred, they, they didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. Now again, this issue is very simple and I want to apply it to today. Because this very same thing, the, the ridiculousness of this action. You're going to Jerusalem. You're not planning on staying around here. Well, if you're not planning on staying on here, you just keep right on moving. You just keep right on going on down the road. And they're missing the blessings, the forgiveness, the mercy, the grace of the Savior of the world. Now, I'm telling you, I share with people, you share with people, that reject the Savior of the world for the very same reason. Because he wants to take them someplace. He's going someplace that they don't want to go. They don't want to have anything to do with. I have people tell me, well, I don't want to receive Christ because I want to continue using my drugs, my alcohol, or living with my boyfriend or my girlfriend. I don't want to go where he wants to take me. And basically, they're rejecting the Savior of the world for the same reason. It's a little different, but it's basically the same. And so I encourage you, think about this, this issue. When you see this, people saying, well, I don't, I don't want to go where he's going. And he's, he wants to do something in my life that, that I don't want him to do. Say, do you realize what you're rejecting? You're rejecting life so that you can continue doing what you want. Do you understand the choice you're making here? You're rejecting forgiveness and eternal life, the meaning and the purpose for your entire life, and you're rejecting that for drugs? What, what a, that is not a good decision. But it's a decision people make all the time. And so these are the two reasons why they rejected him. Now secondly, how did the disciples, how did Jesus respond to this rejection. Very important. Notice that here first it says in verse 51, Luke records, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now this is how Jesus responded to this rejection. He had a tenacity of his soul. He had a resoluteness to his heart. He was going to Jerusalem no matter what the rejection was that came his way. This particular phrase here, steadfastly set, is a phrase that literally means to resolutely set your heart in a particular direction. It describes fixing your heart and not changing. And so, Jesus here is, is setting his face, fixing his goal upon Jerusalem. 
Now this is an important truth because the cross was the most incredible rejection. He knew that was coming. He was going to be rejected by a lot of people that had sat and listened to him preach. That he had, they had seen him do miracles. And he was going to be rejected by them. And he was going to be rejected by people in the religious system that should have accepted him. He was going to be rejected by one of his own disciples and betrayed by him. And then all of his disciples, the people he had poured his life into, were going to bail on him too. You see, so this rejection here in this city was really minor compared to what he knew was coming. How do you get through that kind of rejection? Well, how do you get through the rejection that you experience? You know, there is probably no more greater struggle than to be rejected by someone that you care about, that you love. I talk to husbands and wives that have been, you know, their husband or wife had, has have walked out on them. I'm telling you, that is, that is the greatest a cut to someone's heart that can ever be experienced. Or how about a, a really good friend? You know, David said, you know, when, when he was rejected, he said, you know, if it was my enemy, I could handle it. But he said it was my familiar friend. Those are the most harsh and difficult rejections that you can ever handle. How do you get through that? Well, Luke records this little phrase here, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem for a reason. Because this is a critical key. You have to have this same resoluteness. The same resoluteness and tenacity in your spirit to fix your heart, fix your direction in following him. Let me just read to you some of the things that Jesus said that reveal this resoluteness. In John 12, 27, there on the last night before his crucifixion, he said, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. There's that resoluteness in his heart. This is why I have have come here to this earth to do this. In John 18, 11, as Peter was, you know, after he cut off the ear of the, the soldier that had come to take him in and arrest him, Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? Resoluteness. Determination. And you say, well, where do you get that determination? Do you know that this resoluteness of heart is something that is a fruit of the Holy Spirit? You, you don't have this in yourself. You need the power of God's Spirit to give it to you. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, there is the record of the fruit of the Spirit. Paul said there, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, the word long-suffering in this list is a Greek word that literally means endurance, steadfastness. This is a fruit of love. If you are in love with the Lord and you choose to love others, God will give you an enduring an endurance, a steadfastness in your heart to go through those incredible rejections that you experience. And everybody in this room is going to experience rejection from someone sometime. It's going to happen. How do you get through that? Well, it is by this heart, this attitude. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul there, while he is in prison, explained and described his own heart 
and the same resoluteness in his spirit. He declares, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say in verse 15, this is Philippians 3, 13 through 15. He says in verse 15, Therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. You see, this kind of tenacity in your spirit that presses toward the goal, even when you're in jail for something you didn't do, as Paul is here, I mean, he could, he could have been angry. He could have gotten resentful. He could have said, Lord, why are you letting this happen to me? And that is the attitude that many times we get, is it not? When things don't go well, we get angry and we blame God, or we blame others, or we blame ourselves, or we blame all three, and we just go downhill. Instead of saying, Lord, fill me with your spirit, give me that that ability to go forward, to go through this, we want to go round it, right? Or we want to hightail it instead of going forward. So are you in that place today? Are you, do you want to go around the trial? Do you want to run from the trial? Or are you saying, Lord, take me through this trial? Which, which is it? Because that heart that sets your face steadfastly to go through the problem is really where it's at. Let me give you three passages of Scripture that explain the reason why you need to be steadfast. In all three of these passages, you will see this particular word, steadfast, this endurance, this tenacity of spirit. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, they're the last words that Peter says before his own crucifixion, before his own death. He said, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, and he's referring to the struggles and the trials and the problems that he said were coming. He said, Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord. Now this is critical if you do not want to fall from your own steadfastness. You need this tenacity, this resoluteness in your heart, in your spirit. Ask the Lord for it. It'll keep you from falling from your own steadfastness. Secondly, it's essential for spiritual warfare. In 1 Peter 5, 9, Peter said, Resist steadfastly. Resist in faith steadfastly the devil. An essential thing that every believer needs. Resist him steadfast in the faith. That is what Peter declared. So, are you battling spiritual warfare, thoughts, lies that are going on in your head, you need to resist with all steadfastness in faith. In 1 Corinthians, a third reason, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. there Paul says, this steadfastness is what keeps you abounding in the work of the Lord. He says, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You see, if you want to abound and keep abounding, you want to go forward in your Christian life, this steadfastness is essential. And so, don't boohoo this. Don't think, oh, this is really not that important. Oh, you know, this just... I don't need this. Yes, you do. You need it every single day, and especially in those days when everything is going wrong and everything 
seems to be going the opposite direction. So where do you need that resoluteness today? Where in what? A relationship? Your job? Your ministry? Your marriage? Some friendship? I don't know. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you that resoluteness of heart to set, to fix your heart. I'm going through this no matter what the rejection. And when you have that heart, you will come to the other side. Now, how did the disciples respond to this rejection? Well, let me just say, not well. Another of the failures of the disciples. They want to call fire down from heaven. Now, have you, have you ever wanted to call fire down from heaven on someone? You say, well, no, I haven't wanted to call fire down on, from heaven, but I've, I've really, I've, I've wanted to strangle them. Uh, you know, I've killed them in my heart. You know, the scripture says that if you have hatred in your heart, you have murdered your brother. Do you know that? That's what it says in 1 John. You're a murderer because hatred and resentment in your heart is where that murder comes from. That's where, why people do what they do. Now, this particular attitude obviously was not right. But the disciples thought they were right. Isn't that interesting? They thought they were right. In fact, they even used a verse of Scripture a story out of the scripture about Elijah and they were incorrect. Jesus said to them, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. So they convinced themselves that they had righteous indignation. This was a righteous thing. We should just waste them. Let's just kill them. And, but they didn't understand. Jesus, of course, responds and says in verse 56, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. He said, guys, do you not forget this is the dispensation of grace, mercy? I came to save men, not destroy them. And Jesus had communicated that message over and over again to them that this was his heart. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Not kill him. And so the disciples were very confused. Now how does somebody get to that place? How do they, con how do they convince themselves? How do they rationalize even using a verse of Scripture? Well, first off, they took the Scripture out of its context. If you go back and you read this, in, the, in its context, first, they're under the dispensation of the law. Big difference from the dispensation of grace. And secondly, the people who were coming to take Elijah were coming to kill him. They were taking to, coming to arrest him, to put him to death. And yes, Elijah did call fire down from heaven. Now, was that a good application of that biblical example? Not at all. Were these people trying to kill Jesus? Were they trying to kill the disciples? Not at all. The Lord wants to save people, not destroy them. We sometimes, though, want to destroy them, don't we? You get so angry, you just, you just wish the Lord would just, just take them out. But... That's not what he wants to do. He wants to change them, especially if they're a professing believer. You want them to kill them. You see, there's something wrong with that. You don't know what spirit you are of. It's very easy to convince yourself that you're in the right, and this is what the Lord should do. Now, I'm telling you, this is something that you all have to be very aware of. As parents, the next time you are ready to mete out some punishment, stop and examine what spirit you are of before you mete the punishment out. 
Because I'm telling you, I've had to go back to my kids many times and ask for forgiveness because I had the wrong attitude. Did not know what spirit I was of. So if you don't want to have to do that, then stop and examine yourself. Before you fire that employee, make sure you know what spirit you are of. Before you go blast somebody, know what spirit you are of. I'm telling you, I've had my wife save me so many times in this regard. I share with her someplace, I'm just steaming. I'm angry. She goes, honey, why don't you go pray before you call that person? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think I better. And then you see what spirit you are of. You realize your heart's not in the right place. You're not going to come across in the right way. So stop and examine yourself. Don't deceive yourself. It says in 1 Corinthians 3.18, remember the Corinthians were judging Paul just continually. And what does Paul tell them? He says, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. They were deceiving themselves. These were believers deceiving themselves, and you as a believer can deceive yourself. I have done it many times and had to turn around and repent and get it right. So I encourage you, stop and examine yourself before you take the action. Because the Lord wants to forgive, He wants to reconcile, He wants to have mercy. As you have had mercy, He wants you to have mercy on those that have hurt you and rejected you. In 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter declares to us there that God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. All. And so they should have understood that this was the heart of Jesus and not had this attitude. Now, another thing that I think is so important in the dealing with rejection is that you have to realize that the Lord will recompense. Many times people say, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to say that because they're not going to get away with this. Would you know that no one gets away with anything? That's the truth. The Lord says in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Do not avenge yourselves. That's a pretty clear command. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. A critical attitude that you must have. Lord, I'm committing this into your hands. You see the righteousness of what's right here. You know my heart. You know their heart. So Lord, you deal with this. I'm going to commit this into your hands. You know what is right. And Lord, you will deal righteously every single time. So can you do that? Can you release it really into the Lord's hand and say, Lord, you take care of this. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to choose to forgive in my heart no matter what their response is, no matter how they respond to me. Notice also in chapter 10 here of Luke, look over in verse 16. As Jesus sends the 70 out, just on this last move towards Jerusalem, he sends 70 disciples out to go declare the message again in many of the cities that he'd already visited. And notice in verse 16, he says, He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. He who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Now this is a critical truth that you must have in your heart to deal with rejection. 
Jesus would not say this if this was not important. Notice, it's directly after his own rejection. And he's telling them, you guys are going to get rejected. Now, I go out on the pier on Tuesday nights during the summertime and share the gospel. And we get rudely rejected often. It's just natural. It's going to happen. And you go there knowing that it's going to happen. I can walk up to someone, and sometimes I do. I'll just say, hey, how are you tonight? You know, and gosh, beautiful central coast, isn't it? Yeah, oh, fantastic. Gosh, what a blessed place to live. Look at this, God's creation. It's so beautiful. And, every, you know, you're just carrying on this conversation with them, being very friendly, and they're very friendly back. And, and then you say, May I share the gospel with you tonight? And their face changes. They, they become hard and they get this attitude and they say, no, no way. I don't want to hear this. And they say some very rude things to you usually. Now, why is it that the conversation was so pleasant until I brought the name of Jesus up? Because they are not rejecting me. They are rejecting him that sent me. That's why. And if you can get that in your heart, in your mind, you can handle the rejection. You can take it. When it's your family, when it's your friend at work, no matter who it is, you have to understand that the rejection is not you. It's because of who you're talking about. It's him that they're rejecting, and they are rejecting him that sent Jesus to this earth. That is so clear to me today. And I'm telling you, it really, it doesn't bother me anymore. It really doesn't. You just have to, you have to blow it by, you have to go on to the next person, and because there are people there that do, want to talk to you. And they will say, yeah, hey, love to share with you. And so you do. So be very careful here and be open to understanding this whole truth of rejection. If you need this ability, you need to resolve that attitude that you get towards those that reject you. Or maybe you're struggling with that, that attitude even today. You know, the Bible says there's only one way to deal with that issue of your faulty spirit. You have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's it. In Galatians 5.16, it says, Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, not only will you not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, you will not fulfill the revenge of the flesh. Because that's where revenge comes from. The flesh. There's where the motivation is. And so if you realize that about yourself, you will deal with it. Now one last thing. I want you to note here that Jesus responded by going on to another village. Notice verse 56 at the end. I want to just close with this. He was set steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. He set his heart to go. The disciples, of course, were not in that same place. But he chose to go on to another village. A very simple little phrase, and they went to another village. Now, isn't it interesting that we see here the meekness of Christ? He didn't force him, himself upon them. He didn't force his way into the village. He didn't say, I'm coming whether you like it or not. I have the right to be here and I'm going to be here. No. He told his disciples in Matthew chapter 10 verse 14, he said, if when people reject you, when they won't receive you and won't hear you, he said, whosoever will not receive you nor hear your words... When you depart from that city or house, 
Shake off the dust from your feet. In other words, he says, don't take anything from them, even the dust on the bottom of your feet. He says, leave. Just go. Go on. Now this is, I think, such an important attitude because many times Christians want to force themselves. When a person says to me, no, I don't want to talk to you, I say, God bless you. Have a great night. That's your decision and that's your choice and I am not going to ram the gospel down somebody's throat. When somebody tells you, don't talk to me anymore about this Jesus stuff, respect their wishes. It, it is really not the Holy Spirit to force his way into somebody's life. He waits for them to respond. So do you have the same meekness? I pray that you do because anything other than this will make you obnoxious to someone and they will get angry with you. And so respect a person's wishes. And I just usually say to people, you know what, if you ever want to talk about this subject again, please feel free, ask me, I'd love to talk to you. But I will respect your opinion, your request, and you will not hear me bring this issue up to you again. And you leave it there. It is essential. Now, but is this always the way that Jesus will deal with a rejecting world? No. One day, he is coming, as it declares in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. It declares that he will come on a white horse. And he will come with his army behind him. And it's very interesting that the scripture says several times before this and after it that the people of the earth and the demonic forces of heaven make, want to make war against him. Is he just going to lay down and give up? No. He is going to respond and he is going to come and judge and make war. That's what the scripture declares. Let me read it to you. It says in Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, which I believe refer to you and to me. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You see, today we are in the dispensation of grace. But this day is a day of reckoning. It's a day that he will reckon with all that are living and all that have died. He will reckon with them in his second coming. And so I think the balance of this is very important. Today we are in a place of grace and mercy. Will you receive that? And will you grant that grace and mercy to others? Let's go to him in prayer. Thank you for joining us. I want to encourage you to apply what you've heard today and mix God's word with faith. Believe his promises, obey his commands, take the action God requires, and God will begin to work in your life. If you have never made a commitment to Christ, I want to encourage you to make that decision today by asking God to forgive you. Invite Christ into your heart. Turn from any known sin and begin to walk with him daily. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. If you would like someone to pray with you, please call our office at the number on your screen 
and someone will be there to help. Or in a moment, you will see a simple prayer. Pray this prayer and make your commitment today. God bless you and join us again next week for Truth For Today. Depths unto the heights 